You know, I get asked a question a lot about anxiety and fears that fighters have to overcome when they go into combat. When you become a UFC fighter, you get the immediate street cred badge, the Hall of Fame toughness badge. You are respected everywhere you go. Nobody ever thinks about stepping up to you. And the public sees you as a warrior, unlike any other athlete on the face of the planet. Yeah, it feels like... You thought you were better than him, he wanted to fight. Yeah, he didn't duck anybody. I think that's what made Connor special, special too, and you what? talked about that. Kamar Usman. Usman, yeah. Usman, Usman. all... Usman was running through guys twice. A warrior who has unparalleled killer instinct, a perfect blend of athleticism and skill, and last but not least, knows no fear. I don't think there is weakness, especially on this level. Like the word fear is not in the dictionary of an MMA fighter. After all, they get in the octagon to kill or be killed. Why on earth would a dude like this be afraid? Absolutely no reason at all. Last time he was supposed to be on a stage with me in December, he didn't show up because the sniffles, but he knew he was going to get on, on a stage with Colby Chaos Covington and I was going to have a live mic in hand, so that's what really scared him. So, why is he ducking? Do a quick picture. Sure. Yeah, let's get it. A face off. No, no, Just no, no. A, no, no okay. No, no, no problem. Is he actually legitimately afraid? Well, that happens sometimes, but it's more complicated than you think. Thank you to the fighting business. Absolutely amazing. One of my favorite new channels going right now. When you're an unknown name in the sport and you just got your big break by getting that UFC contract, you are expected to accept every fight the management offers you. No exceptions at all. If you say no, they say goodbye and that's the end of your UFC journey. A random fighter on the roster has absolutely no leeway, but as you grow in rankings, credibility and popularity, this vicious yet simple sport becomes a lot more complicated. Eventually you reach a point where your health isn't the only thing on the line. It's your relevance, your future and the future of those around you. And that's when you start ducking. I mean, you start being selective about your opponents. Nate Diaz turned down a fight with everybody on the roster. For a year and a half we've been offering fights. Sometimes, it's just plain fear of the other fighter, someone who just has your number, and you both know it. That's the only hatred I've had to a person through my whole career has been Chuck Liddell, so... Long ago, and I'm talking about the dark ages of the company, Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz were simultaneously blazing through the light heavyweight division and becoming the faces of the sport. The company needed Liddell versus Ortiz, but Tito wanted no part of the Iceman, claiming that he would never fight his friend, while Liddell wanted to break his skull. I read this interview with Tito Ortiz that before every one of his fights, he would, he would go, go into a room where, where nobody was and, and just cry. The negotiations for UFC 47 dragged on for more than a year, but somehow Dana White was able to work a miracle and get Tito inside the cage with his worst nightmare. There's a lot of nervousness and anger, and there's a lot of anticipation for this fight. This is a true mixed martial arts grudge match, probably the biggest grudge match we've ever had. Fucked up in the first round and put to sleep in the second. It was apparent why Ortiz, despite the money and glory on the line, wanted to stay the hell away from Liddell. On the other hand of the spectrum, and for an even more insane example, you have a champion voluntarily giving up the belt because they'd rather give up the title than face the scary contender. So about Cyborg, uh, she's expected to fight for the UFC belt, but Jermaine Durenemi doesn't seem interesting to, 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 to fight. She just doesn't want to fight Cyborg, I mean that's what it comes down to. You understand this uh, steroid uh, allegation that, that she's using as a reason to not fight Cyborg, or if you think that is fear? I mean, it's fear. I mean, Usada is in place now. When Chris Cyborg was headed for the UFC, the company built the women's featherweight division, and the inaugural title fight took place at UFC 208 between Holly Holm and Jermaine Durandamy. Jermaine was declared the inaugural featherweight world champion, and the Chris Cyborg fight was the obvious next step. But JDR said from the very start and flat out she was not going to face Chris Cyborg, no matter what, because of Cyborg's fast steroid use. I, and I full respect to Jermaine, but Chris Cyborg hasn't been beaten in over 10 years. You know, Jermaine has, and she's been unbeaten at her 145 division. When she first declared her refusal to fight, a lot of people believed that eventually she would be forced to fight. After all, there is no way a champion would duck and risk getting the title stripped, right? I knew there were gonna be consequences on the, on the fact what I've said, but if you look back at my history or leading up to the 145 title fight, I've always said, I go back to 135. The sad thing is, given how she was able to trouble Nunes on the feet, Jermaine would have had a decent shot against Chris Cyborg, but she was defeated before the fight and gave up the title of the best in the world. I'm here right now, I'm fighting Raquel Peddington, and 
I hope after Saturday night we can leave that all behind. That's the dread of losing to a fighter who seems unbeatable and just as destructive. You fear the near definite loss of course, but you also fear the impending damage, the scars and the person itself. Jeraine Durandamay, the Iron Lady, she can fight Cyborg. Well, she comes out and she says, I'm not fighting Cyborg. And Dana kind of looks back and goes, well, you're the champion of the world. If you're not going to fight Cyborg, I'll take the belt from you. Boom. The Iron Lady says, boom, Dana, great idea. I think you could have handed Jermaine Dana White's blank checkbook and she still would have said no. After all, no amount of money will make you face the Grim Reaper, but let's move on to a more prevalent, less depressing, but more infuriating method. In these cases, you don't view the other guy as the Grim Reaper. Hell, a few years ago, you would have fought the guy without hesitation. Fuck the damage, you didn't care. But the situation changed, and you have a lot more to lose now. But yeah, Ian Gary, I want to see, he called out Colby Covington. I think that's a good call out. I, I, that's a fight I want to watch. That'd be a sick fight. Despite the lackluster performance against Leon Edwards, Colby Covington has no reason to be terrified of Ian Gary. The Styles clash actually favors Colby, and there is good reason to believe that this grudge match will be one of the biggest fights UFC can make in 2024. But from the very start of the online feud, you knew Covington was not too keen on fighting Ian Gary. Can you imagine? This kid's a spoiled little fucking entitled brat. In his most recent interview, Covington doubled down on his refusal to face Ian Gary and proceeded to call out Bilal Muhammad and Charles Oliveira. First off, there was never a contract. If there was a contract, show me the contract, kid. I don't think Colby is necessarily afraid of Ian Gary. He doesn't care about the damage Gary will inflict inside the cage, but rather, he is definitely concerned about the damage an Ian Gary loss can do to his position. Let's be honest, if I'm gonna fight a guy like this, and I'm gonna go through a whole training camp, and I'm gonna spend all this money to bring in training partners, my coaches are gonna give me all the time, what if he does the same thing again and pulls out? Then my coaches don't get paid, then I can't make money, now I just wasted a whole training camp? like. He's not serious about business. You know, the ship sailed and, and you know, I'll fight whoever I want to fight when I want to fight. When a fighter reaches the top of the sport, or in Kobe's case, the near top, they are no longer just athletes. They are brands. Their value is tied to their record, their ability to draw crowds, and their marketability. And one loss can ruin it all. If Ian Gary goes out and sleeps Colby Covington, then the former interim champion will be looking at the end of the road. By talking outrageous amounts of shits and ticking off nearly everyone he knew, Colby Covington has built a brand for himself, and he is looking to keep it alive. At least, we move on to Colby's best buddy in college, John Jones. I've noticed a shift in the reception towards the heavyweight champion because when he won the title at UFC 285, he was the fan favorite and declared the GOAT of all GOATs. Greatest of all time, ladies and gentlemen, John Jones! I'm really excited to fight Stipe Miocic. Yeah. There has never been a fight that means more to me than beating Stipe Miocic. Uh, I don't think I've ever fought a GOAT and people consider him the greatest heavyweight of all time. Recently though, the MMA fans have begun to turn on John Jones because the interim heavyweight champion Tom Aspinall is going to fight a rightful contender in Curtis Blades, while Jones will keep the belt hostage to fight a 60-year-old Stipe at the end of the year. In a supposed DM back and forth, I've already agreed to make 15 million my next fight. Hell yeah, bro. I'm about to beat up this old man. Ant, ride off into the sunset. Hope you enjoy watching. And yeah, of course there's a chance I can get knocked out. I'm fully aware of that, but yeah. I'm putting it on the line. Yeah. And quite frankly, he isn't. <laughs> now, if Colby Covington is a brand, then John Jones is a dynasty. Back when he was the light heavyweight champion, John Jones fought them all, beating different generations of 205 killers and has always been obsessed with victory. There is this famous quote which was brought up by the former tennis great Jamie Connors where he said, I hate to lose more than I love to win. And this mentality perfectly describes the competitive mind of John Jones. My logic was, if this guy were to beat me somehow, um, I, I can look myself in the mirror and say that, well, I lost because I got hammered the week before the fight. I did it my whole career. I, I would go out and get hammered one week before every fight. Weighing the risk and the reward. Nobody respectable, especially the champions of the world, are usually allowed to play by these rules in the sport. But that's exactly what John Jones is doing. By fighting half-retired Stipe Miocic in his last fight, he secures a much less dangerous opponent for a more valuable legacy name on paper. But we're watching this happen right in front of our eyes. We know Stipe has passed his prime, that he was brutally knocked out in his last fight, that his last victory was half a decade ago. So. How exactly is this justifiable? As impressive as Tom is, 
it's not important enough yet to determine my schedule and my decisions. John Jones has been damn near perfect his entire career, inside the octagon obviously, never truly lost a fight, won back the belts every time he had the chance and stayed on top of the sport for as long as he was around so the legacy, the brand, the dynasty, everything that he has built over the course of his impeccable career is at risk every time he steps in there and Tom Aspinall might just be his worst matchup and he knows it. But yeah, I feel like I'm kind of beating a dead horse and just keep crying about it and I don't want to. Okay. That, that's John's business, John can do his thing. If we fight, great, if we don't, great as well. All respect to John Jones, one of the goats of the sport. John Bones Jones, the fighter, most definitely wants to smash Tom Aspinall's face and silence his critics. But Jonathan Dwight Jones is a businessman and he knows that he's nearing the end of a very successful and deeply personal venture. It's not fear of the opponent, but instead, the fear of losing it all. Some examples of ducking are exactly that, ducking because you don't want to end up in the cage with someone who has your number and you know you just cannot win. Turns out even these badasses have a limitation and they understand getting into a losing battle and suffering trauma and a hopeless effort is bad for their career. But let's get another thing straight here. Ducking doesn't always mean cowardice and it doesn't stem from fear or dread. Sometimes. It's a calculated business decision because once you reach a certain point in the sport, it's not solely about fighting anything, but playing the game as well. That said, it's still annoying as fuck. Get YouTube SEO masterclass, editing, breakdowns, all previous and upcoming videos, music, playlists, downloadable thumbnails, your name in these wonderful credits, and so much more on Patreon. Have a look at it right here. And with that being said, I gotta bounce. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.